Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Heiko Braun. I've got a fellow right here, Dimitris Andriadis. We're both from Red Hat, and we are going to talk about Wildfire Swarm this afternoon. Um, in particular, in the context of like right sizing services, um, and we get into that in a in a minute what that actually implies. So, when you attend conferences like these. There's two things that you typically, two terms that you typically run into, monolithic architectures, microservice architectures, one way or the other. The big question that always comes up, the discussions in the, in, in, in the, uh, in the hallways are typically about like bold claims made for one side over the other. So there's people pretending that, well, monolithic architectures are, are easier to reason about and Soft, we should stay with that. Other people are all into microservices for, for all the benefits that may be they may bring. In fact, the industry as a whole, I believe, except for a very few companies, um, has a lot of experience with, with like large-scale microservice architectures. So the, the question this raises is, is this an either-or decision? And when I thought about preparing these slides, I, it reminded me of, of a quote from an American author called Mencken. Mencken said, well, there's always a well-known solution to every human problem. It's neat, plausible, and wrong. And I think in the context of this discussion, why I brought it up is that we shouldn't believe that neat, plausible microservices are going to solve all our problems. Neither do monolithic architectures. So it's really about engaging with the thought process, like what's right for our specific circumstances. To frame this discussion, I think it's useful to, to further look what's actually implied in these names or in these terms that we use. Um, if you look closely, we, we easily speak about the monolith or a microservice. Um, but in fact, it's, it's really about monolithic architectures so it's, it's about the properties of those architectures and microservice architectures. Going further, looking at what the IAE says about like what, what actually is a software architecture, they define it as a fu the fundamental organization of a system embodied in its components, their relationships to each other and to the environment, and the guiding principles for its design and evolution. Um, I think that that's a quite useful approach to kind of like address all the questions of where we position ourselves when we have to take architectural choices. And if we further break it down into different properties attached to the one side or the other, you see that typically in, in monolithic architectures we talk about at a very at the macro level at very at fewer components, things that we have to worry about. Whereas in microservice architectures, we typically have many of these things. Quoting Jonas Bonnet, he says, microservices typically come in systems, right? So it's, it's not one single service, it's, it's a bunch of them. Their relationships are quite different. So I just added a few things that came to my mind preparing this talk. Mm. In monolithic architectures, typically you have like, when you consider the space aspect, things are co-located. Um, whereas in microservice architectures, these services are typically distributed. So regarding the time aspect, monolithic architectures typically force you to change things together. Whereas one of the tenets of microservice architectures is that you can change services independently. There are many guiding principles, but um, just to name two very general ones that I found useful for this discussion is that it seems monolithic architectures are more addressing the, the need for uni uniformity, whereas microservice architectures propose diversity. So diverse choices of runtimes, programming language, etc. It's a non-exhaustive list, so you can add your own ideas. It's really just to set the scene and um, frame the discussion. The way I see it, and it's useful um, to, to guide these explanations that you see in a minute about what Wildfly Swarm actually is and what it brings to the table, I think it's very useful to understand that 
there is not one way or the other. You know, it's actually about a continuum of architectural choices that we have to make. So there may be monolithic architectures on the one end. This is where we are coming from, what we are all most familiar with. And microservices on the far other hand. But there's also something in between. Um, when, you coming, when you're coming from Java EE, the, the question is where, where would you position yourself? Like if you have to put a, st uh, a stick in the, f an, in the ground, like I would think that typically most Java EE applications tend to be residing more to the monolithic side, to the left end in my diagram here. So why, why is that the case? Well, application servers have been built to accommodate these needs. The guiding principles have been slightly different. And the way we use them have been different as well. But in fact, it doesn't have to stay that way. Um, and this is what leads us to Wildfly Swarm. So hi, um, I'm Dimitri. I'm uh, the engineering manager of the Wildfly and Jebus Enterprise Application Server team. So. Uh, this part of the talk is about Wildfly Swarm itself, which is a it's a sister project to to Wildfly uh, or a sidekick project. So, um, Wildfly in term is in turn is the you know the thing one called uh, JBoss application server. So obviously it carries a, a long history behind it. Uh, it started about 15 or 16 years ago. Um, so the basic idea behi behind Swarm is uh, that we, we essentially have a transformation process. We take the typical application where in Java e it involves most so probably some kind of runtime and application server in which you have your base uh, APIs and services, implementations of those services, um, and the application makes use of them. And through this tran transformation process, we want to take your app and the pieces of the runtime that are relevant to your use case and package them together and make this self-contained uh, binary that you can execute and it's more uh, aligned with you know, DevOps practices and, and cloud environments and, and all this stuff. So, so in this in this way, you, you have the option of right sizing your runtime so you can start from monolith and break it down in a in a more in, in a, in a smaller, smaller monolith there was a very good uh, talk just this afternoon talking about uh, modular monoliths and how you can create either you know a componentized slice of your application with some services included and maybe a separate uh, web layer um, and that can be a very good you know, use case uh, for for the majority of, of of systems. If if you know scale is not your your first priority, um, or go all the way to the right, implement you know microservices. There are dozens of ways to, to to do that. Um, so Swarm gives you you know options during this uh, transition. And of course, the goal of of Swarm is this. Uh, Uber uh, jar, the fat jar, or however we, you want to call it, which will bundle together, you know, application and capabilities. So in Wildfly Swarm uh, parlance, uh, capabilities are fractions. Uh, we will talk more about the fractions, but for um, when looking at, at, the, at this fat jar, um, you will find inside, of course, your app and there's an internal Maven repository that will contain the code and the modules to uh, for the fractions. Um, there is some bootstrap code, obviously, to glue everything together. Um, and there's also the notion of a of a hollow jar, which is the same thing minus your deployment, so your your actual application. And this is interesting to cases where you know you're developing and deploying many multiple times a day possibly 
Uh, so the part that changes is actually your application, the, ru the runtime, the customized runtime might remain relatively constant, so you don't want to pay the, the cost of transferring this runtime back and forth. So you have this option as well. Um, now, s since I come from, you know, the Jabos um, part of the house uh, and and Wildfly, I, I should say a few things about the the base base runtime that enables both Wildfly and and Wildfly Swarm. Um, this comes from a sub project of the Wildfly application server called the uh, Wildfly Core, and I think there are a few pieces that are interesting for this discussion. Um, some capabilities that we've uh, built into uh, this this kernel when we did our let's say our third generation refactoring of Wildfly, so you know, 15 years project. W the, la the third generation was created sometime around 2010. So some key characteristics was the, the modular architecture. So we, we have our own module technology, of course, before Java 9 and all the stuff that comes now, um, which helps a lot if you wanna uh, split the server into pieces and capabilities so you can pull into Wildfly uh, Swarm. Um, and it leads to a more, you know, nicer design. You don't, don't, you don't have class loader here. You, you can combine pieces more easily. And the other piece which is very interesting is our kernel. We call it the modular service container, which is uh, has this property that I don't think anyone else has. It. It's, it's concurrent. So when we design this third generation of of, of application server, we had in mind that we have more or less picked in terms of how fast processors can go. So now processors have more cores, and um, to make use of the cores, you need you know parallelism. And the fact is that most frameworks, when it comes to boot time, they're pretty much serialized, uh, except Wildfly. Wildfly actually boots in parallel so we don't we don't have to do a lot of lazy loading tricks we do some lazy loading but not too much so when you boot the server you have you know parallel threads you know executing your deployment plan so to speak which leads to very fast and, and lightweight runtime that can scale from the biggest monolith to the smallest microservice and i think that's interesting um, we also have some features that lead to you know cloud friendliness so for example we have replaced uh, tomcat with uh, our new web server called undertow um, undertow was designed from the start to be asynchronous uh, based so it leads well to um, you know reactive based uh, applications or applications that need to scale uh, at a high level um, and it's very fast also, you can find on the net some very interesting uh, benchmarks that compare Undertow with uh, the other web servers. Um, and there's also other interesting things like, you know, multiplexing all protocols over HTTP, whether, you know, JSON or, H or you know, even uh, RMI, even, uh, you know, JMS. So we can do all those, those nice things to reduce the number of ports we use in the cloud. So back to fractions. Uh, Fractions is our compositional unit in Swarm, um, and it's, it's really a Maven artifact. Um, and the fraction builders, what what they do is they uh, they include the code essentially to, to to they have a means to package the capability. So th when you're thinking about capabilities when it comes to Java, eh, just think about you know EE APIs. So things like uh, JPA, JAXRS, uh, CDI, those are separate capabilities that uh, we treat as, as, fa as fractions. Um, and um, the fraction code will, will package this and will have a way to configure uh, this capability when, uh, when it brings it to the runtime. Um, and We'll do that with some reasonable defaults, which is key in, in, in Swarm. So when you bring the various fractions into your uh, runtime, uh, you don't have to do much work, uh, which is very interesting. Um, and uh, for the most common use cases where you want to override uh, things you know, that are common, like a port number or a binding address, you can do that with properties. 
that's you know a very easy way or you if you are more familiar with the wildfly configuration model uh, you can actually use xml so swarm can accept the the standalone or xml descriptors that we use to configure the application server if if that is your your choice um, and um, swarm contains a large number of uh, fractions um, there are about 80 something fractions you can discover if you go to the wildfly swarm.io website uh, half of them relate to java ee um, half of them relate to uh, other capabilities that uh, Heiko will talk about uh, to connect you with, you know, uh, uh, cloud services, discovery, um, distributed login, uh, and all those nice things. And, you know, more fractions are added. Some of them are stable, some of them are experimental. So you're welcome, you know, to, to join uh, the community. It's very, uh, you know, welcoming and it's an open source project. So, you know, you can add your own fractions if you want. Now, uh, to enable Wildfly Swarm, uh, you you have to use either uh, Maven or Cradle, but Maven is the, the primary, uh, you know, supported use case. So, um, all you need to do basically is just stick the uh, the Swarm plugin into your POM, uh, and and then also specify as dependencies, as Maven dependencies, the the fractions that that you want to bring into your uh, application. Um, there's also the option of not specifying any dependency, in which case Swarm will, uh, will enter a mode where it will try to uh, detect uh, what, you what you want to use for your application. So it will check uh, the imports of your classes uh, and it will pull the, the fractions that are necessary. And fractions, of course, have, have dependencies. So, so when you end, you know, when you ask for, you know, JAXRS, JAXRS might bring in login, for example. And there is also uh, ways to have, uh, you know, collections of fractions under some name. So, um, again, Heiko will talk more about this about uh, micro profile. So, micro profile more or less defines three different fractions that are brought together. Um, and that's pretty much it. That's what you do to enable a, a standard Java E project and and make it, uh, you know, a swarm uh, fadjar. Um, so then you do that, and then you do Maven package, and your war or jar will be packaged together with the fractions, and you will get back this my application uh, does swarm dot jar. So that's the fadjar. And then you, of course, you have different ways to to run it. You can run it directly on the, you know, Java minus jar, the name of the jar. It's executable, obviously, um, or you can run it through the Maven uh, Wildfly Swarm run uh, target, or even you know, in the ID, you can click on on the default uh, Swarm uh, main class. Uh, this is uh, org uh, Wildfly Swarm uh, Swarm class, or there there are cases where you can also provide your own main if you somehow find that the configuration options, the default ones offered, does not do what, what you want to do. You want more fine-grained control, you can uh, get control of main. And this is roughly how you do it. So um, you just provide you know, a, a main class, you reference it from, from your POM, and this class you, you instantiate the runtime. So the the swarm uh, class represents the, the swarm runtime, and you just create it. You add uh, the fractions in terms of code. So in this example, we see uh, we we add the JAXRS fraction, and we just accept the defaults. You see, there is nothing. We configure nothing there. We just add this fraction, and when we are done, we go and we say start the runtime and deploy the default Maven artifact. So if if that was a war, it will be deployed and started. And, um, you know, for this use case, you see now, I just want like uh, JAXRS. If you try that uh, with a sample appli application, you will get something like a, a binary that's about 4.5 uh, megabytes big and can boot in, you know, one, one and a half seconds. 
And there are cases that you want to have more fine grain control. So in this example, you see uh, how you can configure a data source and a um, and a JDBC driver. So obviously, there there is no reasonable defaults when you want to connect to a database. You have to say, you know, I want this JDBC driver, and those are the you know the the options to connect to the database. So if you do it in code. Uh, you will create the data source fraction, and you have this fluent API to configure every single, you know, detail in in the data source. And it's interesting uh, if you are familiar with with, fly, with Wellfly, you you might see the difference between the names of the functions and the configuration uh, model in in Wildfly. Um, so. In fact, what we do is we actually generate the Fluent API from the schema that describes the configuration model. And, and that's, that's how we do it. And with that, I will pass it back to, to Heiko to move you further into this, this journey uh, with more advanced use, ca use cases. Um, it work? OK. So. You've got an outlook how, how Swarm actually works. So the, the, as he said, the basic idea is like deconstructing the app server and putting it back together, pairing those parts of your application with just the parts of the runtime actually required. So far, everything is based on Java E. That's where we're coming from, if you remember the, the continuum of choices that I outlined, outlined in the beginning. And actually, if you listen to people like Adam Bean, for instance, he has an excellent video channel where he explains what, what you actually might be doing with Java E. You can take it very far, like uh, if you want to move into microservice areas. So Java E is quite capable of doing many things, and there's good reasons to stick to those APIs that you're familiar with. But the further you transition to the microservices side, like um, at some point, you, you hit cases where you need additional capabilities things that are not given in Java E out of the box. And this toolkit approach that we take in Swarm to transform like the application resources using the fractions into standalone binaries, that's one half of the story. The other half is like bringing it in additional capabilities um, that, e that go beyond Java E. So you're moving to the right end. The first thing that you notice is that um, the complexity basically moves elsewhere. So we've, we've got a nice monolithic architecture as well. It's, it's easy to reason about. Everything is in one place. It locks to the same file. Diagnostics are um, fairly simple to do. But um, the, the downside is all the updates to the application that moves as a monolith have to be coordinated outside of the technical realm. So you need to talk to your peers and make sure that everybody agrees on the same release date before you can put something in production. This is actually why people look into microservices on the other end, because here you've got well-defined services, hopefully with dedicated teams behind it, and these services are to be moving separately. So, um, But what you see is here you get the benefits of moving separately and faster, but um, the complexity, for instance, the operational comp complexity um, drastically increases. Plus, you're actually moving from like a single co-located thing to like a distributed system. Um, the point here is not about saying one way or the other is preferable. It really depends on where you're coming from and what problems you need to solve and what kind of architecture we are talking about and what systems you need to build. So I think it's better to frame the discussion in, 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 in terms of like there's better or worse choices depending on what you need to achieve. Fowler, Martin Fowler, mm, identifies three distinct competencies. So he coined this term like you need to be this tall to be able to move to microservice architectures. And this is the article that's referenced right here. It's, it's a worthwhile read. Uh, the, the gist of it is that he outlines three different competencies that are needed to really make use of the benefits that microservice architectures promise. So you need rapid provisioning. That means like the, the ways to stand up servers quickly 
you know, when they are needed. It shouldn't take like several weeks to order a box, send it to the data center and um, have somebody setting it up. Today, it should be a click of a button in cloud infrastructure, for instance. You need additional monitoring capabilities for obvious reasons. I mean, the operational overhead increases to a, a significant amount. Uh, things get distributed as a lot of services running in parallel. The update cycles are different. So how do you get an overall view of what's going on in the system and how do, you, do you diagnose problems? And even more importantly, all these microservices ideas don't buy you anything if you're not able to really rapidly deploy the application to production. So that means taking it through the whole chain of like implementing the new functionality, running it through the testing CI environment into production. Fola and many other people agree that this should be automated end to end, ideally. Not everybody's in, in the same position to achieve, th achieve that, but um, interestingly, these are really just competences that are not, that are it's general applicable to both monolithic architectures and service oriented architectures. And going back to Swarm, this means that there are some, if you move across this continuum to more service oriented approaches for the benefits they bring, there are many aspects that you need to consider that go beyond Swarm. So we, we Swarm isn't providing the continuous deployment pipelines. You know, we are not going to provide you the cloud environment that you are go going to deploy to. Uh, these are just things that you need to be aware of when you make a decision, like where to put your stick in the ground in this architectural continuum. But nevertheless, tools like Swarm can support you um, in three different ways. So first of all, extending the functional scope of what's inside Java E, um, providing additional integrations with like new technologies, other systems, etc. That means like additional libraries, configurations, stuff like that. And extending the programming model that's that, that we have in, in, in Java E. Um, and this is best outlined if we look at a few examples in the next few slides of what you can find out of the box in Swarm. Um, there may, for instance, be the case when your application, so we now have, think of a self-contained binary and this moves across the different environments. As Dimitri has outlined, in Swarm by default everything is baked into the binary for good reasons. You know, you want reproducible results across these environments, you want to prevent configuration drift, so it makes sense to kind of like nail it down and have it traceable back to a single line and commit, a uh, single commit message in Git. But you can say, well, this was the change introducing a configuration modification that led to this behavior in the system. Um, but for some cases, this doesn't work out. The JDBC URL that he demonstrated is a good example. So you need a different t database to test with in staging environment and another one in production. In Swarm, one way to go about that is to pair um, the self-contained binary with an application YAML or project stages YAML that you see on the left hand here. It's broken up into like different documents in, in YAML speak. So this is like the small dashes that you see. And each stage carries a logical name. So there's one stage for development and one stage for production. And the idea is when your application moves through these different environments, you can flip a switch to enable of, uh, configuration overlays um, to change the log level, the JDBC URL, anything that might change between staging production and other environments that you traverse. Here, that's out of the box behavior. It's not a specific question. It's something that we just inher inherently provide with Swarm. Another common case that you run into, like if you move from monolithic to microservice architectures, um, services need to talk to each other. So how do they actually find them? It seems to be obvious, but there, there is no common way to achieve that. There's a bunch of service registries that you can lean on, like console, Zookeeper, etc. But it needs, we need to provide means to kind of like advertise our existence for others to look up the service and get its, 
uh, to, to, to kind of like interact with it. What you see here on the left hand side is basically it's always a couple of like this is the fraction dependency that you can refer to. And at the bottom, in this case, you see a, a, an extension to the programming model that allows you to kind of like say, well, this particular deployment should be advertised as the pricing service. So we've got a bunch of integrations with like various service registries for OpenShift, for console, etc. Um, another common thing that you may run into um, is the need for providing health checks to the cloud, which is particularly relevant in, in cloud environments. So if you think of, for instance, Kubernetes-based systems, they break down into a scheduler, and uh, the load balancing component, and somewhere in between these, these boxes in between, those are the services that you build with Wildfly Swarm. Um, in Kubernetes, the, the terms are liveliness and readiness checks. So there is a time when the scheduler says, well, create another instance, we need to scale up the workload because the, um, or the number of nodes because the overall load of the system increases. And it needs to know when, when it's ready to perform actually work to be registered with the load balancer. This is the readiness check. Liveliness is, is the corresponding way of probing into a working node and checking if it's actually able to perform work. Um, these are typically application level concerns, so one way I didn't implement, so our example program extension down here that you see is an extension to the JAXRS specification or CDI specification. You add a health annotation and it provides an API for you to signal if the system is lively or not by indicating health status up or down. Here it's always up, so there's no logic to actually verify anything. It might be a call to a third-party system to verify that the system is actually t available, like the database. Um, performing file system checks, memory, whatever is useful and reasonable in your specific cases. And this is then used to provide an entry point to the scheduler down there, where it can poke into your system continuously in periodic times to see if it's still healthy. If it's not healthy, it will just discard the service and schedule another one. Again, just an example of something that we already have. So here the dependency of the fraction is called Swarm Monitor, which gives you both like the service part, like the underlying runtime capability to enable this HTTP endpoint that's um, discoverable and supports a specific wire format and an extension to the programming model by bringing in one simple dependency. And as we move on, you kind of like hopefully get the idea what we are trying to do with Swarm. So it's both extending the, the base capabilities that you find in Java E. Sometimes this requires us to extend the programming models, like in this case, and overall hiding the, the, uh, the complexity behind that. I mean, you could do the same thing, like implementing a custom HTTP endpoint using JAXRS, but there's a lot of nitty-gritty details that you need to worry about. Another common issue that you find when you move from service-oriented architecture, uh, from monolithic architectures to service-oriented architectures is you need, uh, Think of the system like when it's being decomposed, you break it up into distinct services and these services kind of like interact with each other. In our example here, what's happening is that the client um, might be a browser client, invokes on a service and this service then requires to talk to another service. So there's a series of interdependent um, remote calls, which are all good throughout most of the time, uh, just in the one case when it's not good anymore. And all you see on the client side is that the request takes forever. Um, now, with everything being distributed, running on different f uh, virtual instances um, that are ephemeral also, so it's really hard to tell like when, when they come and when they go and where to poke into, it's hard to say, was it a library that was like taking up all of the processing time or the store or the pricing service? So distributed tracing kind of like brings this information forward. It 
and conceptually, it just attaches the client, the first invocation from the client with a, a, gener a UUID, which is then propagated through all these service invocations. And each service here has an instrumentation site, which kind of like takes that information and reports it to some storage backend. So when you then go to that backend, for instance, Zipkin provides a backend or Open Tracing provides another one. Um, you're able to see similar, uh, a similar representation, a graphical representation of how a complete series of requests unfolds. Again, here the case is you see an example of how it's being configured in Swarm. It's really just adding the Zipkin fraction and telling it where it should report the data. Um, what the sample rate might be, etc. So there are some configurable settings. Um, but the wiring, like actually attaching that to a, an incoming HTTP call that's then mapped to a JAXRS resource which performs the business logic and returns the response, is something that's taken care of under the hood. So you can think of fractions as internally they actually do much more than, than they look like. So they bring in APIs in some cases. Um, here they also instrument like the, 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 the HTTP invocation, so they integrate with like the HTTP subsystem in that case. But they also tweak WebXML, for instance, if needed, like whatever is required to set up that functionality and properly integrate it into the overall application. Um, so if you think about this example here, the client doing the remote invocations and assuming that all the services are uh, separate and have to cross network boundaries, it's useful to see that there was one faulty guy, like in nine out of 10 cases, the store may be failing and taking up all the processing time. Typically in, in app servers, as of today, most of the processing is still attached with single threads, so the invocation comes in, we attach a thread to that, we run through all the business logic, and then we return the result and free the thread. Um, the issue here is, in, in those situations, what might the, custom, the, the, the client actually see here? It sees a wait, waiting indicator in his browser that spins forever. What do I do? I typically reload and I reload again. So with every reload, another thread is being spawned up. Um, what tools like Hystrix, for instance, do, Hystrix is a component that comes from, from the Netflix open source environment, is that they kind of like detach or encapsulate certain invocations in separate commands that run on a different thread pool. So that's the one thing you can think of, a simple runnable that's kind of like taking performing the job that's in creating the web client here and doing the remote invocation and then processing the response. Just the fact that it's happening on another thread frees the calling thread from like being stalled. But it, in addition to that, it watches the execution of that command and aborts it if needed. So it, it really stops the execution if it exceeds a certain timeout. If continuous problems occur, it kind of like shuts down and switches to a default fallback to fail fast until somebody fixes the problem. Here again, Swarm kind of like takes Java E a little bit further or the use cases that you may anticipate by bringing in other components. Here the Hystrix um, component in a way that um, Hystrix itself is already set up and prepared for you to make use of it. And it, at the same time, extends the programming model by introducing this circuit breaker annotation. So this is just another way to demonstrate like how, this, how fractions actually bring in additional capabilities and extensions to the programming model. And all of this just to support your journey from the monolithic architectures to um, the service-oriented ones. There's plenty of things to it, uh, much more that I, I can go through in this session. So as Dimitri said, we've got roughly about 80 fractions at the moment, and half of it are dedicated to Java EE.
So when you get going with Wildfly Swarm, the first thing that you notice is um, practically all Java E capabilities or the, the major majority, anything that you find in Wildfly, is supported out of the box. So you need JaxRS, use JaxRS, need JPA, use JPA. Um, the other half is dedicated to things that make the transition to service-oriented architectures easier, like in the previous examples. So there's integration with Logstash and FluentD, so if you uh, have the Elasticsearch, Logstash, Kibana stack running somewhere to collect all your logs to make sense of what's going on in the microservice architecture, there's a fraction to integrate logging or to change the logging to to push it to a remote system into Netflix, uh, in, into um, that remote end. There's integration with Netflix Ribbon. So Ribbon I is another IPC library from, from Netflix that tightly integrates with, um, with Hystrix, like with the previous resilience examples. It can be used as an alternative to using JaxRS client APIs, for instance. Uh, we've got support for various service registries. Um, I think in the example previously I demonstrated or sh I showed how, how to integrate with Consul. Consul is a f prominent one uh, written in Golang. There is plenty of work happening um, to ease the integration with OpenShift or Kubernetes-based environments. So the health checking, for instance, plays into that. Um, there is work in the pipeline to support um, Kubernetes config maps. So if you think of the initial, e the, this quick configuration, the brief configuration example that we did, rather than having a file in Kubernetes, you can have like the system provide all these properties to you, the, the Kubernetes system, which is called config maps, and there's an integration with that. There are means to kind of like bring in Swagger to document your services. So Swagger is um, a way to annotate your JaxRS resources so that it generates a contract description of that or an API description that can be displayed and handed to other people who need to involve with that service. Um, here again, enabling Swagger would just mean bringing in the Swagger fraction, which also brings in the API for Swagger that carries the annotations that you can put into place but also the instrumentation to kind of like render the Swagger JSON file that describes the contract at the end without you having to touch all the nitty-gritty details. Um, we've got an integration with um, WordX. So WordX is um, the JBoss approach to reactive programming. Here the integration is yet another fraction that allows you to kind of like specify which WordX event bus you want to talk to, so you can dispatch events to it and receive events through it into message-driven beans. That's your log for management, InfiniSpan integration. We inherit all the management capabilities from, from Wildfly itself, so Wildfly has a fairly um, sophisticated management infrastructure. You can remote manage all the nodes that you spin up with Wildfly Swarm using either of the tools. Um, it might be the command line tool to poke into a node or the, the web management interface. There's integration with Active and Queue. Um, we've got many of the components integrated with a tool or a, a, a project called Keycloak. Keycloak provides identity management, authentication, and single sign-on, which is quite useful if you like break up into different services and you need to secure like service-to-service -service communication. This requires quite some work on, on various levels, so on the HTTP level and on the, on the JAXRS level, and this is taken care of. There's extensions for contract-based testing, if you're into that or familiar with that. So contract-based testing is the idea of having, rather than integrating everything and running one integration test suite, which in microservice scenarios can be quite cumbersome or a lot of effort at least, um, you basically specify the client-side contract of what the client invocation would look like on a service. It's being recorded into a description of that contract, which then can hand off offline to the, s to the service provider, which replays these events to make sure that anything the client expects to do, the service implementation is capable of doing. 
So and by this, it detaches um, or it prevents having both services to be instantiated at the same time and verifying it through more sophisticated um, integration tests. Much of this work um, that goes beyond Java AE plays into an effort um, that you find on this conference as well, which is called the MicroProfile. Um, I'm not going to tell too much about it, but the basic idea is um, to take enterprise Java um, to a level that's suitable to address all these service-oriented needs. You know, if you move through the continuum, a lot of questions come up, you need additional integrations, the and in the micro profile, we basically feed back these ideas that I demonstrated here into a wider group. It's an open collaboration between like single individuals from the community, representatives from the, from the, um, the different vendors implementing um, tools like Swarm with the attempt to find consensus, like to see what works, what's, n what's needed, and um, possibly standardize it. But um, it's just an aim. I would call it a pre-standardization effort. So it's, it's about like figuring out what's actually needed today by enterprise Java developers um, and finding common ground between the majority of vendors so that you get a kind of application portability and reduced risk with that. Um, but still being able to proceed quicker than we did with the JCP and other terms. Which doesn't mean that nothing of this will could then actually end up in, in, in Java E8. And in fact, if you look at the Java 1 keyload of this year, you find some of the ideas already proclaimed by Oracle themselves. So they, they changed the technical direction of E8 to accommodate some of these ideas that we saw here already. So uh, E8 is supposed to include health checks. It's supposed to include configuration. You know, It's a little bit uncertain where the journey actually takes us, but um, this is just to outline that Swarm has the intention to kind of like bring it into the Swarm open source project first, then feed it back these ideas into the micro profile, and from there it may be ending up in, in the Java E8 or in other future version or just reside within the micro profile. If you are interested in this particular topic, there is a buff tonight, so at 8 o'clock, where we just meet and greet and talk about what might be useful or needed in future terms. And there's um, a session tomorrow morning where uh, people from Payara, Tommy Tribe, Wildfly Swarm, and IBM Liberty actually meet to demonstrate how f what we've achieved so far. Um, so coming to an end, um, what we try to address with Swarm is to provide a spectrum of possibilities. So it's really about enabling choices. Um, one way to go about y the next project might be a combination of monolith and microservice architectures. So um, taking a low risk element of your monolith, extract it to become a service and leave the remainder on your application server. That's totally fine. Um, learn along the way, like figure out where the nitty gritty details are, what the caveats are, where the problems are, what's challenging and how the organization maybe needs to align with that. An alternative approach is something referred to as self-contained systems. Um, there's an, a fabulous web page about self-contained systems if you Google it from some, I think it's a, ge a bunch of German companies who coined this term. And self-contained systems take many of the guiding principles of microservice architectures, but are less rigid about the decomposition. So you could think of a self-contained system as a smaller monolith. It still has a front end and a persistent storage, but they, the aim is here to kind of like provide a more majestic monolith that moves fast, um, given that you have like rapid provisioning and rapid deployment cap competencies in your organization without taking it too far to the right end. And I believe that there's actually very few companies um, who, who take it to the extreme. I mean, not everybody is Netflix or Amazon. We, we 
we wouldn't all have like thousands of services that are updated every minute. Um, I think in the future it's more likely that in a, in a few years' time, I think we see that these ideas kind of like converge, that the microservices side learns from like s the monolithic parts and the monolithic architectures learn from the microservices. And there, there will be a new term maybe for, for these kinds of architectures. So ThoughtWorks came up with this idea of calling it evolu evolutionary architecture. So to, to kind of like get back from this was it really a bad choice to call it microservice because it implies like something small. Um, the first reaction from the programming communities or these practitioners who attend these conferences like this was, well, that has to be measured in, l in lines of code, which doesn't make sense. Um, today we are a little bit more smarter, but in general, the um, uh, our partitioning, uh, practicing communities, like all the software developers out there, all the architects, all the people involved with building software, um, are still on the way to learn how this could actually best apply to their own circumstances. And I think um, Swarm, as a takeaway message, is an attempt to kind of like address the need for people coming from Java EE to engage with this journey and help them by bringing in additional capabilities and the aim to kind of like hopefully standardize or pre-standardize some of that. Thanks. If <laughs> so there's a project web page. Um, it's a friendly community. Engage with the community, ask questions. Um, for the remaining 10 minutes, we've got a microphone right there. Dimitrius and I will be around, so if you've got questions, this will be the time for it. Good, thank you.